Thank you everyone for joining this innovation workshop part of the Genesis 2021 conference. And I have to say the last innovation workshop of this season. And last but not least, we're very pleased to have our returning organizer, Nedidia, to um, cover a very exciting topic. And I'm very glad that they always come with these amazing ideas which is on MedTech and the Internet of Medical Things. So you have a great panel who will share a mix of presentations for insights and a mix of discussion. And of course, you are very welcome to ask any question, but I would just request to drop them in the chat box and then we can pick up on them uh, at the appropriate time. In the meantime, if you can just keep your camera off and microphone muted just during the presentation, that would be amazing. And so thanks very much for joining again. Uh, I think you, for those who joined at the beginning, you heard the recording in progress uh, voice. So this meeting is recorded. So that's for you to catch up later on or of course to share with colleagues who may have interest in the topic as well. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I am leaving the floor to Jay, who will be your chair today, Jay. Hello, yes, thank you, Aline, for passing it on. And it has been always been a wonderful experience to organize events for One Nucleus. And today we have a very strong panel members who will be covering the topic of MedTech and the Internet of Medical Things. And we have got it right from a, an innovator's perspective, a regulatory perspective, uh, the health clusters, and also to see how all of these things can be done, making sure that your MedTech idea is not just an idea, but it also turns out to be a commercial product. So uh, at first on the panel, we have Brandon, who is a cluster manager with Connected Health and Wellbeing Cluster. Uh, Brandon, could you just wave and give a very short introduction about you and your cluster? Thanks, Jay. So I'm, I'm based in Dundalk, Ireland. It's a new Connected Health and Wellbeing Cluster that aims to bring together industry, academia, uh, enterprise support agencies, and um, most importantly, healthcare providers, and um, I suppose the cross section of industry from technology and healthcare and other areas that are currently, I suppose, moving into the uh, med tech sector. Okay, yes, thanks for the short introduction, Brendan. And next we have on board with us Greer Deal, who is the director at Global Regulatory Services. Hello, Greer, would you please give a very short introduction about you and your company? Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. So um, as Jay said, Greer Deal, director of Global Regulatory Services with a parent company of Medidia. And um, we are a regulatory consultancy um, across the world. Um, focusing on everything to do with the life sciences. Obviously, today is to do with um, medtech. Um, and Jay quite often likes to refer to, you know, we're the equivalent of when people say we want to Google something, we would like to be your regulatory Google in everything to do with regulations and quality compliance. So we have a network of um, specialists all around the world who can provide the expertise that you need when it comes to regulatory and quality compliance. Yes, that's very well said. And thank you, Greer, for adding the regulatory Google part to it. Well, I guess that's a new word that's coming up into the market and the industry. Yes, so thank you so much, Greer. And now I will be moving on to introducing the next panel member, which is David Didsbury, who is an ALAMD expert, which is artificial learning, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning expert from Didsbury MedDev Limited. Hello, David, would you like to introduce yourself and your company? Um, hi, I'm a um, regulatory and quality uh, device guru, and I specialize in helping small to medium sized companies um, do, do anything to do with regulatory, regulatory and quality. So that's from 13485 right through to um, talking about software and getting mobile software products delivered to the market. Um, Didsbury MedDev has been in existence since 2015, and uh, recently um, my small company has expanded to include the next uh, uh, to include Paul Butcher, my cybersecurity expert, because with the with the changes in the FDA and changes in the MDR, having a cybersecurity arm will make a big difference to 
to the growth of my company moving forward. And that's me. Thank you. That's very really interesting. And congratulations on the expansion. And uh, and thank you for also mentioning Paul. So next coming up is our cybersecurity expert for this session, which is Paul Butcher from uh, Didsbury MedDev. Uh, and he would introduce himself and the company in a very short brief. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul. And uh, yes, I'm at the cybersecurity arm today's company. Um, my background really is is always been in computer architecture from, for many years. Uh, so I've designed a lot of systems and I've also done a lot of security work within engineering and lately in the financial sector. So I'm used to working with banks and finance and data warehousing. So they are very keen on keeping their data secure, I can assure you. So that's really where I'm coming from. So I hope the presentation is, is of use to you anyway in the future. Thank you so much, Paul. And last but not the least, and who is going to be the first presenter for the day is Eva, who is the International Business Development Director from Elside Medical. Hello, Eva. Would you like to introduce yourself and your company? And then I would request you to give your journey into the innovation process, and we will move on with your presentation from there. Thank you, Jay. Um, as said, that the, uh, I'm Eva Laiko, and I'm representing a digital health company, a digital health startup called Asset Medical. Asset actually stands for Automated Lifestyle Advice, which actually introduces a little bit what we are we are doing. We are a small technology company uh, supporting our uh, health uh, service providers and patients in chronic condition management. And although we were approaching from the uh, technology angle, we were supported by research teams, uh, local university teams, and the uh, people with a strong medical and nutritional background to build that software, which we think that they uh, could be important uh, in the future and supports digital transformation in healthcare. So I wonder if, Joy, would you help me with the slides, I think? Thank you. So our mission is actually to support people with chronic kidney disease and diabetes or who face the risk to develop these conditions in the near future. And our approach is that the digital transformation doesn't just digitalize whatever process you already have in place, or doesn't just uh, trying to make your actual treatment digital or transform data digital, but also provides better service or just the uh, correcting and adding services which were previously uh, not possible. So that's why we said that it's personalized and, and, and digital and data driven. And yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> because this is, uh, this is how our story started. So our sto story started after long discussions with health providers uh, to whom our team members provided technology support from the very early stages of digital transformation. So we installed service first. And then we started to provide things like basic software and then patient management software, uh, patient data development software. Sorry, that's a little bit too quick. <laughs> uh, and then we learned that these non-communicable diseases are a big burden for the individual as well as the health system around the world. So kidney treatment required about one in five billion pounds of the NHS budget alone in 2020. And treatment includes a restricted diet and complex medication. And as the cognition advances, patients needed expensive and time-consuming dialysis treatment or kidney transplant. So next slide, please. Because main reasons behind chronic kidney disease are uncontrolled diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular problems, often caused by unhealthy diet and lifestyle. Unfortunately, COVID infection can also cause kidney failure. And these diet and lifestyle elements are also creating chronic condition management, but very often overlooked and neglected, although could significantly slow down the progress of the disease. So there was a gap here. We learned that most people just do not get the personalized and regular support to have adequate diet or lifestyle. This is lack of resources, lack of available dietitians, lack of time, everything. And the challenge is really, in brief, to translate recommended potassium levels, sodium levels, carb levels, energy levels, nutritional requirements into soups, main courses, salads, also considering food allergies, individual preferences or activity levels. And without digitalization, you just can't do it. So next slide, please. 
this looks a little bit complicated, I see. So this is, uh, this is the platform and it stands for automated lifestyle advice. So the artificial intelligence helps the user to get personalized patient education content, menu plans optimized for condition management, the care goals based on personal and medical data and habits and needs and preferences. And it also connects human clinicians and dietitians with the patient, with the patient user for monitoring and support. And the algorithm uses menus configured by human dietitians as examples, because menu planning is not only math equation. You normally don't have, say, X with jam, so just don't trust the algorithm without the human support to create something like that. Condition monitoring was made easier if the user connect to personal health or activity device, such as Fitbit, smart scales, pulse oximeters, smart blood glucose meters, because now these are widely available and used, but their data is rarely shared with any clin clinician. So the features include fully auto-generated menu plans, content finds the user, content recommendation system for patient education, or the uh, specific support for patients with multiple conditions. And also we are here to help to, uh, to uh, automate time consuming uh, task of dietitians like nutritional calculations, many configurations or patient data analysis. So next slide, please. Yeah, this is just a patient journey. Uh, once the patient connects to the system and the dietitian connects to the system. So this is a platform connecting the professionals uh, with their patients. And the patient after enters personal data and preferences, after informed consent, uh, this data can be shared with dietitian to set initial goals, track progress, condition, and in addition has professionals can add content like patient education information, recipes and menus. You can actually assign a menu or a specific piece of content to a particular patient. So next slide, please. And this slide just illustrate the three main pillars. One is dietary support, one is tracking and analyzing data, and the third one is personalized patient education. So most of the users having a condition actually have more than one chronic condition, but they still prefer to use one application to manage them all. So digital health should also be beneficial for the health professionals. And also it should automate tasks, give access to important patient data and enable integration with other subsystems within the healthcare system. So it should connect to personal health records. It should connect to diagnostic or patient management systems. Otherwise it's just all little different islands and it actually requires more time rather than less time. So next slide, please. I think this image really speaks for itself. They are all the uh, groups of main stakeholders who could benefit from digital tools, not only ours, but uh, similar tools, uh, managing chronic conditions. Next slide, please. So this is attraction, what happened so far. So after the initial software platform was developed, we launched our first pilots, added some initial content and started to commercialize first in our local market, Hungary, and then in the UK, we were supported by Sheffield Hallam University as they ran an accelerator program for local and international startups. And by November, we create our mobile interface for patients with some new features like QR code read for various food products. And we also completed our first regulatory assessment because MDR just came into force and we just finished the MVP. So COVID made digital transformation as a must have an accelerated adoption of digital health products. It's still a long journey, I think, with long uh, stakeholder education, clinical evaluation processes, continuous development and assessment on the basis of feedback and initial experience. So next slide, please. Because it might be relevant to talk about regulatory challenges. So applications like ours can be considered as something like a borderline product. So it can be used for prevention or managing lifestyle aspects to keep the condition at bay. But ACID also has features which can be utilized when the condition is more advanced, so say in a real clinical environment. And in this case, diet or lifestyle control is actually part of the official treatment and it's part of the night nice standards and clinical standards and recommendations. So the intended use and risk level can have an impact on the definition if our product is, is actually a medical device. And 
we process individual health data. So we also must comply with privacy and security related regulatory requirements, GDPR and uh, cybersecurity, which later will be discussed. And sometimes you really need to dig, to dig deep and be considerate when creating a regulatory strategy for different markets as they have different regulation and regulatory status can also determine if you can access certain market. One example is actually German DIGA, which is app for prescription, but this is only uh, for software, which is categorized as a medical device. So as you see, there is a definite demand for a wide range of digital health products, but there are several challenges and problems to be solved before full adoption. And thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much, Eva. It was really interesting to look what your platform is offering, and I'm sure this entire journey would have been uh, good of a roller coaster right for you and your entire team. And yes, you did mention about the challenges with the regulatory, with AI, especially and ML coming into the picture. And thank you once again for giving us a brief introduction and helping out understand more how your product was developed and the innovation process worked out for you and now i would like to move on to our next speaker um, uh, <clears throat> and we are going to pass it on to david ditsbury who is going to talk to us about the artificial intelligence and machine learning and the regulations associated to it especially in the united states of america and the united kingdom so David, um, I would request you to take the audience to on the entire journey on what are the regulations in AI, ML in the US and in the UK. Over to you, David. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jay, for your, in, your introduction. Um, could you by any chance put my first slide up? Brilliant, okay. And I'm gonna say, next slide, please. Okay, um, I'm gonna leave the audience to read the slides while I talk around them. So, and as um, mentioned at the beginning, they, they will be available afterwards. So uh, machine learning and um, AI software is a specialist area now for the um, regulatory authorities in terms of how they're going to regulate them. But the fundamental question is what, why is AI and ML so important? It, it's got the ability to transform patient, patient information and patient health by identifying trends that isn't re isn't readily available to uh, uh, to read, and that's going to lead to some very innovative products. And it has led to some to some innovative products. Um, so next next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the reason for putting up some definitions of ML and um, AI is to understand that the ML is at one end of the spectrum and AI is at the other end. And there's a whole lot of different bits of software that fit in, that fit in, that fit in between, uh, right? So um, machine learning, right, is, in, is important to understand because that's where in your development environment, you, um, you, control, you control data sets and you control how much it the algorithms learn. Um, artificial intelligence, on the other hand, You've done some in-house testing, you know it's performance, and then hopefully you, you know how it's going to develop in the real world when you release it. So there's less control over artificial intelligence. Um, next slide, please, Jade. Okay, so this is presenting a wide challenge to regulatory authorities. So we'll, we will start to look by seeing how the FDA are looking at AL and MI. They've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years uh, trying to figure out a way forward because the typical route for a medical device product is you know its form, you know its function, and you know its claims, and it's never going to change. But that's not true with AI or AI products in particular. ML products, maybe because you might you might have put a degree of change in. So and the standard regulatory models around the world don't like devices that continually change in the field. So it's presenting a challenge. So the FDA started a couple of years ago by coming up with a pre-cert pre program, right? And that was where they were looking at the design and development environment of, of a number of companies, 
right, to see if the culture was correct and how, how they designed the, the products so they could prove the quality control side, right, and then look at the, you know, the functionality during their 510K. Um, they also published a, um, a clinical evaluation guidance document about how software as a medical device can be uh, can be approved because again it's a challenge to the normal you know clinical evaluation process so it's not like um, meddev 2.7.1 rev 4 there's a different they're, they're taking a different approach and hopefully i'll get get a chance at the end towards the end of this presentation to say that uh, next slide please jay okay so the fda have come up with with, with something called a total product lifecycle approach to, to, uh, to software, to AI and ML software in particular, right? The existing method doesn't quite work. So as you can see from the diagram on the chart, that the, um, so they're looking at data selection management, module training, et cetera, right? So they're looking at the culture and quality of the organization. And then and then they're going to look at pre-market assurance and safety, safety and effectiveness. So that is, how is your product going to perform when it's out in the, the field? What have you actually built into the product, and how do you know? It, and how do you know it's going to change? Um, and that safely flows flows into point three, which is the review of the SMD, the pre-specification and algorithm change program which I'll talk about in slightly more detail on the next slide. Right, okay, and the last point on that slide, okay, I realize I slipped the word next slide in without meaning it, um, but anyway, so the next, the final part was how the, how, how the product performs in the real world and whether, whether you can capture transparency to see how it's working and the sort of degree of change that you can get with it. Right, okay, next slide now, please. Right, okay, the, um, so the FDA have come out in the last, I think it was about a year and a half ago, with something called a predetermined control plan. And that plan consists of um, algorithm change protocol. So this is where during your design process, you sit down and work out how, how the protocol, how your algorithm is going to change if you release it into the market. And you start to build up a case a case study around that, and then and then when you get then once you've worked out what that's doing, you can then write something called um, pre pre specifications. So just like with a traditional product, you can say, well, this is what this you know this new incarnation of my product is going to do, and whether it's a change in intended use or or change in function, right? You've got that you've got that spec out. So then when you when you go into your um, five five ten k approval process with the FDA, they can they can get a real understanding about how your software was developed, how you're going to control it in the future, and what's no you know and, and what the flow path is to changing it when it's out in the field. So they have a good understanding of what they what you're asking them to approve. Transparency is required so that the FDA can, can, you know, can get that feeling of assurance, of assurance to safety and effectiveness. Um, next slide, please, Jay. All right. Okay. So the algorithm can change, change protocol. This is all about sort of data management, retraining. Right. So how do you, how do you do it? How do you retrain software? How do you prove it in performance evaluation and you know the last section is update procedures so that again it's going back to how you as a software company develop your software right okay and how do you plan to update you know one of the reasons why ai ai in particular and ml is um uh, different to a standard product is that is the fact that software can be adapted really quickly so if there is a bug you can change it, you can move forward and do a quick, you know, download release to update it in the field. So, you know, this presents big challenges to the conventional, uh, the conventional model of approval. 
Right, um, next slide, please, Jay. Right, so if you've been through this sort of 510K process where you've agreed certain changes with the FDA, you can see on this chart here that, that there's a way of going through the 510K process quicker because if you're going through your degree, your, de your degrees of accepted change, right, and your algorithm is working how you've predicted it, then, then you can go through these stages of releasing new versions or allowing it to change without having to go back to the FDA. And then when you when you get towards the end of your agreed your agreed um, number of changes, then you can go back to the FDA and say, well, we're now at this stage. Um, we'd like you to agree some more changes. And here's our SPS and here's our algorithm control plan for the next version. And you can get approval a lot quicker than a conventional product. Okay, um, next slide, please, Jay. Okay, so training. So we're back now to, uh, you know, back to looking at the quality inside the company, right? And your, and your process, and your processes. So, you know, when they're looking at the, looking at your organisation, they want to know about test methods, um, quality, you know, your quality processes, the quality of the data sets you're using. Is there any bias, bias in them? Where did you get that data set from? So you're looking to have robust out algorithms and you want high quality and well-labeled training data. A, a, common set of a common set of principles applied both across AL and MI in about how you verify and validate, validate these. Okay, the, uh, you can go to the next slide, Jay. That's all right, good prompt. Um, in the UK, now we're outside Brexit, we are, um, we're looking to be different. At the moment, you know, we've got in inverted commas the MDD, right? Because that's all that's what was on our statute book at the time. So there are now two ways um, for digital healthcare products to be uh, to be approved. One of them is through the um, through the multi agency um, advisory service, and that's actually an amalgamation of the MHRA. Nice, the CQC, and uh, and the NHS, and they, there they look at your value proposition, your intended use, what your product product classification is, and how much of the you know where you are in the AI spectrum. Um, right, so um, Nice have come out with a set of frameworks um, questions to you know so you can mark yourself against it, and you know what sort of clinical evidence you've got. And you know the nice framework includes things like cybersecurity, information governance, right? Um, the benefit, the benefit of your product, um, right? And how it works. So whether you're downloading it to a mobile phone or you're putting it in the you know the IT infrastructure of the, of the um, hospital or into IT US or somewhere to look for things like you know predicting cardiac arrests, right? They they have a way now of doing it. Um, the MHRA, uh, okay, are looking to, um, they've just finished a consultation, right? And the consultation is going to take us from our current understanding of where we are with, uh, with the UK version of the old MDD to a more um, MDR type situation in the UK, but they're building in a very fast pathway for AI related software using using the MHRA and NICE and a few other um, key partners to approve to approve software right under the um, MHRA banner if the um, consultation period um, agrees with it and that will allow you to get to market earlier right and then they can see the real world performance of it and and if they're happy with it then they'll then move you on to a notified body to get your C, to get your UKCA mark and um, you know the number to go on the bottom, right? So, you, but because the MHRA isn't set up to to look after clients for a longer period, right? So they want to pass that burden across to the um, to a no, to not a notified body. Sorry, I mean an authorised body, 
change in terminology after 30 years in the industry. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, yeah, so where are we today? Well, the FDA in conjunction with the MHRA and Health Canada have finally produced a guidance document on good, good machine learn, learning practice, right? So for all you, um, for all the companies out there that are doing ML and um, AI software, they've laid down now the basic criteria of what they're looking for. So this is very good if you're doing an international product. So my advice is to go off and check, you know, take this list and go off and check, to see how you're doing against it. And if you need help with a gap analysis, feel free to come and talk to us. Right, and finally, my last slide, please, Jade. Right, so here we're coming to the, you know, one of the harder crux size of, side of the um, designing software, right? Actually, have you actually got um, clinical evidence to prove the claims, to, clue, to prove the claim or prove your, you know, your value proposition, right? So they will be looking for the connection between your intended use statement and any evidence that you can generate. And, you know, they're, they're using something from the International Medical Device um, Regulatory Forum, who are, who are a global group of um, competent authorities, right, to, to give you a more of an IVD type feel to the clinical evaluation. Um, again, if you want more details, um, please ask. Um, and finally, you know, both the FDA and um, the MHRA and the EU people, you know, expect man software manufacturers to have established high, you know, good quality systems gearing to delivering and developing and maintaining high quality products throughout their life cycle. Um, right, and now I'm ready to hand over to Greer. Now, oh, thank you so much, David, for providing this all of this information, especially revolving around what's happening in USFDA and in the UK. And definitely there are good points and I'm sure the audiences might have any questions related to it. So if you have any questions, or uh, this is for all the audience listening to us, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop in a message in the comment section and we will take on the questions right after all the panel members are done. Yeah, and I could see that mm -hmm. David did mention about various things in the UK and in the US FTA sector. And now I would like to pass it on to Greer who would help us and give a better global structure to this. So Greer, would you like to just Tell us, based on your industrial experience, what are the critical challenges for medtech innovators? Thanks, Jay. Yes, um, I think I'll focus more on the European um, to compare with the US and, and the UK. And um, I mean, Ava has already touched on this. There's, there's, to my mind, there are three key challenges um, right now. Um, and the first one is actually defining your software. So Ava mentioned in her presentation that with them, it was determining whether it was a wellness device or, you know, or was it actually a medical device? Um, and it's surprising how thin that line is and how easy it is to flip from just a wellness device into being a medical device. So it's really, really important that companies um, take time to de define their software um, as per the regulations, and we've got the new medical device regulation and also the incoming um, IVD regulation as well. And then what happens once you've defined your device, then you have your risk classification if it is a medical device. So once you've got your risk classification, then you understand what your pathway to market is. Now, talking about risk classifications, we've moved in Europe from the medical device directive to the medical device regulation. And with the majority of software companies that have produced um, uh, software as a medical device, their devices have been up classified from a class one where you didn't need a notified body. Um, it was a self-declaration. 
it's been up classified to class 2A at least. Um, and that now means that these companies must engage with an EU notified body. Um, and that presents issues in itself. So the EU notified body, um, we have a small, smaller pool than under the medical device directive. Um, and also not only that, you need to be able to choose a notified body that has software as a medical device within their scope. And that could actually reduce the pool even further with regards to choice. So there's more companies now coming in needing EU notified bodies, but less notified bodies that can service this sector. So what's happening is, I mean, I know of companies who are trying to get quotes for their um, quality management system audit, plus their technical file review. Um, and it's taking anywhere between three and nine months just to get a quote, which is crazy. So if you're if you're looking to try and engage someone now, um, then good luck. Um, and obviously we will do our utmost to help you in finding someone who who will engage with you and take you on as a new client. But if you're thinking, oh, I can leave that to later, don't. You've got to get going now. You've got to get into those discussions with these notified bodies. Otherwise, you're going to be in a very, very long queue. Uh, especially when you've got IVDR coming through as well and more diagnostic companies are going to need to engage with a, an EU notified body. The other thing that David and I actually were discussing the other day is that some companies, you may already have your 13485, which is your quality management system, and have it audited um, by an existing EU notified body. Um, and now because you've been up classified as a software as a medical device, um, you need to get a technical file review. So you go and talk to your existing uh, notified body and they say, well, oh, that's not within our scope. And you go, OK, so I'll find another one notified body. And um, and they say, well, your quality management system, your 13485 is with, with another EU notified body. Well, we need quality oversight. Um, and apparently this is hidden within the medical device regulation somewhere. How do you define oversight? Well, the notified bodies are interpreting that as in, we're gonna do your technical file review and also have your 13485 and do your, your auditing. So you could be in a situation as a company where you have 13485 certification with one EU notified body, you need your technical file reviewed. So you have to engage a second EU notified body, but then that EU notified body says, oh no, we, we need to audit you as well for your 13485. So you end up being audited twice, paying for the privilege twice and having two 13485 certificates. So how are we going to resolve that? I have no idea. <laughs> and, and maybe this is something to flag up to the EU Commission. But, you know, it all comes down to how you define quality oversight. So that's the second major challenge. Um, the third um, is, and I know this with Medidia, our subsidiary in Ireland, that a lot of Irish companies are saying it's much easier to go to the US first. We're going to ignore Europe altogether. It's in a bit of a pickle. It's too complicated, too costly. We're going to the US. So off they go to the US. Great. We understand that. But if the legal manufacturer is in Europe and then you want to sell elsewhere, you can't get your, your um, certificate of free sale unless you have a CE mark in the country where you are. So if you're, if you're the legal manufacturer in Ireland, for example, and you're only selling into the US, you haven't got a CE mark, but then you want to sell, well, maybe into the UK, even now that the UK or Great Britain is outside of Europe, you actually need to get your CE mark in Europe because that's where you're based in order to get your certificate of free sale to be able to sell into Great Britain. Maybe that's not such a good uh, example, but maybe somewhere like Australia, somewhere like that. So that's another challenge. So, so great, go, to off, go off to um, America, but actually you may still need your CE mark in order to enter other new markets. So those are the key three challenges that I see at the moment.
Okay, you're on mute. <laughs> I hope you are able to hear me now. Yes. Oh, I think yes. everyone needed. I think everyone needed to pause after I shocked them with all that information. <laughs> yes. Um, so thank you, Greer, for highlighting those questions. And there is a question in the chat box from Isabel, who is asking, under the new EU MDR, are there any SAMD products that remain in class one? I believe there are. Um, and I think maybe David, I'm going to put you on the spot, might have a better idea of that. Thank you, Greer. And I love being put on the spot, as you can imagine. Right, um, rule 11, right, which is in the MDR, um, yeah, defines what the uh, class 2A, class 2B, and what class 3 um, software devices are. Software is a standalone product, right? And then if you don't fall into any of those categories, then guess what? You're a class 1 device, right? So you can be, you can be ruled out if you're not doing, uh, taking decisions to do with diagnostics or, or therapeutic purpose, right? Then you're, you're fine. If you are doing those, you're a class 2A. If you are uh, nothing to do with um, your death or irretrievable deterioration, irreversible deterioration of a person's health state, uh, health state. So if you're not doing things like cardiac, cardiac monitoring in intensive care, right, for example, and trying to predict um, when you're going to have a heart attack, when the patient's going to have a heart attack. So if you're not doing that, right, then you're safe. Right. If you were doing things like that, you'd be a class, a class three device. If you're doing something, something to do with surgical intervention, then you'd be a class 2B. So again, if your product is not doing that, um, software intended to monitor, monitor physiological processes are class 2A. So if you're not doing that, um, the chances are you, you, fall into the, you fall into the class one product. I was just thinking, of, uh, it just seems as a practical matter, there's almost nothing left in, in class one, as you know, from the things I look at on a day to day basis. I was just wondering if that was your experience too. Um, well, there are, you know, there are some in the sort of decision supporting side, and, and there are, you know, there are some real, real basic, you know, real basic ones, especially. Um, where they're doing things where they're not in direct contact with the patient right so yes there are there are a few left there but 80 percent is what we reckoned that was going to be up uplifted leaving a field of about 20 second 20 20 people left or 20 percent left right okay but again come and ask us and, and um, you know if you've got some software and we'll help you work out what, what where you fit on the spectrum Thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks, Greer, for getting this. And I hope this answers your question, Isabel. And even if you want to discuss more, uh, I will be posting a link where you can directly send questions to any of our panel members, and you can engage with them right after the session. Okay, so now moving on. Greer and Eva and David, all of them have mentioned a lot about this medtech space the developments in IOMT. And this exactly brings us to the spot where when there is so much development happening, there is one element that is constant, which is cybersecurity. And with cybersecurity revolving all around us, it is important to know more about cybersecurity and internet of medical things. And for this, I would like to invite Paul to come over and take the session and guide our audience and discuss more about cybersecurity and IOMTs. Over to you, Paul. Okay, Jay, thank you. I'll do my best. Uh, so this is a, it's a brief introduction to cybersecurity. It's a broad subject, um, and I'm including it in the of medical things as well. So I hope the short presentation goes some way to placing cybersecurity foremost in your minds uh, when it comes to designing that next IOMT device. Uh, next slide, please, Jay. So cybersecurity incidents in healthcare are growing around the world. Everyone involved in the design and manufacture of IOMT devices needs to be vigilant with regard to all aspects of device security. Uh, this has to stretch to the management who need to support any policies and capital spend with respect to cybersecurity. 
which you will struggle to implement a good cyber strategy in your company and for your products. And we've noticed this, that um, it takes, like I say at the bottom of the WannaCry incident, it takes an incident like that to wake up some directors to spend some money on cyber security because it's, sometimes it's the last thing they think of. So in cyber security, we talk of the attack surface. It can be a device of software, a single portable device or a whole computer system of many nodes. And an attack surface is where adversaries and all hackers will concentrate their efforts. So while MOT device, IMOT devices have many obvious benefits, connection of them to your network will always increase your attack surface. So on, I just mentioned there, you might think, why well, have I mentioned USB stick? So that USD, USB stick you may have found on the coffee table in, in, uh, in the coffee shop rather, around the corner, it may just have been left there on purpose as it's a known technique of getting you to introduce malware to your own systems. Next slide, please. So this is a simple definition, but refers to most of what we hear or read about when computer hardware or software vulnerabilities are exploited. So such as data being stolen or encrypted by an adversary uh, and only available after a ransom payment or users intentionally locked out from computer systems for extended periods of time, uh, disrupting access to computer services in healthcare facilities. And if you're paying a ransom once to release access to systems encrypted isn't bad enough, uh, there's a new term associated with ransomware, and that's called double extortion. That's right, they make you pay twice. Next slide, please, Jay. So what are the Internet of Medical Things? So as you can see from the slide, um, they're sophisticated devices. They're connected and communicate through the Internet, cloud, Wi-Fi or BTLE. And if attacked, they do have the potential to cause harm or divulge personal patient data when compromised. Next slide, please, Jane. So there is no doubt to the benefits of IOMT. Um, in the coming years, thousands of IOMT products are predicted to be available on the market. Apart from, and apart from the obvious healthcare benefits, there's also the opportunity to collect a vast amount of clinical data for research into disease management, in which I'm sure AI will play a big part. Obviously the device and its clinical or personal data needs to be protected when confident, with confidentiality assured. However, if the IMT products are continually prevented from delivering these benefits because of poor security around the device and its software being exploited by adversaries, then unfortunately, a lot of the benefits will be lost along with the faith in the device's ability to maintain its integrity. Next slide, please, Jay. So as you can see, what we gain on mobility and being able to remotely monitor, we lose to the lack of access control unless we include cybersecurity strategies in our designs. Uh, so what do we do about it? Well, the risk is recognized and regulators have enhanced standards and guidelines to include more cybersecurity requirements and strategies. Uh, for instance, the International Medical Device Regulators Forum Principles and Practices for Medical Device Cybersecurity uh, stretches to 46 pages of guidelines, but it's a wealth of useful security information, and I highly recommend IOMT design teams to read these guidelines. So next slide, please, Jay. So this is just uh, the, e well, th th this regulatory standards, and this is the EU which brought the MDR, sorry, the EU, the EU MDR brought cybersecurity significantly into the medical device manufacturing world. Also, the MDG, MDCG 2019 provided us with over 40 pages on cybersecurity requirements. So as you can see, there's a lot of guidelines and a lot of, a lot of standards to read for, for everybody. So from a cybersecurity point of view, uh, the third point really means that the classification bill, as classification reaches the two, two B and three, indicating a higher risk to patients, your cybersecurity efforts need to be significantly more robust. 
Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of the guidelines and regulations currently. Um, achieving compliance to the latest EU regulations with regard to cybersecurity is unlikely to be obtained unless you utilize and observe the recommended standards and guidelines. There are a number of new cybersecurity standards and guidances as shown, and many may overlap. And it's not uncommon for manufacturers new to cybersecurity to seek help and understanding which they need to be compliant to. Next slide, please, Jay. So from the IMDRF, I'd like to note these two sections, and that's the first is 4.2, total product life cycle, to effectively manage the dynamic nature of the cybersecurity risk management should be applied throughout the total product life cycle where cybersecurity risk is evaluated and mitigated in the various phases of the TPLC, included but not limited to design, manufacturing, testing, and post-market monitoring activities. So that's the 4.2 section. 4.3 is shared responsibility. And I'm quoting from the, the document here, is the medical device cybersecurity is sh a shared responsibility between stakeholders, including the manufacturer, healthcare provider, users, regulator, and vulnerability finder. All stakeholders must understand their responsibilities and work closely with other stakeholders to continuously monitor, access, mitigate, communicate, and respond to a potential cybersecurity risk and threats throughout the life cycle of the device. So that's really showing that everybody has really got to work together uh, with regard to this. Next slide, please, Jay. So why invest in cybersecurity? Uh, well, sophisticated attacks mean you have to be more proactive about cybersecurity and you cannot rely on the basic level security tools anymore. So we talk of, they used to talk of perimeter security, that is just not good enough anymore. And so you've got to introduce a lot more controls, but also education. And for instance, you know, do you conduct cybersecurity education uh, of all the staff on a regular basis? It does get a mention in a number of the guidelines as a requirement. Um, all employees need cybersecurity awareness training, even including such basics as awareness of dealing with social engineering and phishing emails is useful. Many companies employ CBT security training, for instance, as a requirement to be taken by all staff uh, every three months. And that's something I've encountered in the banking industry. Um, next slide, please, Jay. So we need to cultivate, cultivate a cybersecurity mindset. So just as you would consider a risk to patient safety when developing a product, you should also consider cyber, cybersecurity risk as well. So remember, every time that the product has an update, a cybersecurity risk assessment or analysis should have been carried out before releasing that update. Remember, ultimately, poor security could lead to the patient, patient data or healthcare organization being subjected to unnecessary risk. Next slide, please, Jane. So CIA, uh, these are the three common cybersecurity principles used across all industry sectors and known as the information triad. These three principles should form the basis of your cybersecurity strategies. Uh, there's two other principles used by security, for example, in cryptography, and that's authenticity and non-repudiation. Uh, you may not need these, but they can be useful in some cases. Uh, I believe legally uh, that people use non-repudiation, um, but that's another subject. Uh, next slide, please, Jay. So supply chain management, um, SBOMs, software bill of materials. This is a new requirement and certainly the FBA want to see it as being part of the risk analysis process. Procurement need to ask, um, where did the components for your product originate? You know, what verification was carried out on them? Did they come with known vulnerabilities? Have you records of a CVE references? That's a current vulnerability exposure. Uh, and this should include all digital components, such as uh, systems on a chip, SOCs, and software libraries, particularly. Okay, next slide, please, Jay. 
Uh, threat analysis. Um, I want to cover this briefly. It's a big subject, but I want to cover it briefly as it's a standard requirement and hopefully you're all aware of threat modeling. But for those who are new to cybersecurity side of design, it is well worth taking a more detailed look offline uh, from this conference. It isn't easy. It can take some time to complete and you will need the input of a design engineer along with a cybersecurity engineer. However, the benefits are that you can demonstrate to regulators and clients that you've identified vulnerabilities during development and that steps have been taken to remediate this, avoiding the exploits by adversaries. There are, many, there are a number of programs that you can employ in certain particular techniques, Stride being one of them. So um, three modeling, four basic uh, threat modeling and four basic questions really. Uh, additionally, these well-known four questions can be asked in the context of an application, architecture, operational data flow, uh, broader system level threat modeling as, as appropriate. And they're, they're simple questions, often the best ones. So, so when determining what can go wrong during threat modeling, manufacturers should consider unintended or malicious mis misconfiguration of software and hardware, uh, for example, connecting the device to the internet that was not designed to do so. Um, these, these questions actually come from Adam Shostak. And if you've read his book on threat modeling, they're the four questions that you start with. They're very simple, uh, but they're great, really. They, they sort of set you thinking the right way altogether. So uh, the last slide then, please, Jay. So in summary, um, I can't emphasize enough that cybersecurity be built in from the very start of your design and that you should maintain that cybersecurity emphasis throughout the product's lifetime. And that's important. You, you can't just put it out there and forget it because you, there's going to be a problem with it. No matter how well the software seems to be written, there's always somebody out there who will find a vulnerability in it. So that means really always keeping all of our products and the data they handle safe and secure as best we can with state-of-art cybersecurity. So I hope that was useful to you and, and, and thanks for listening. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for giving a good insight on the cybersecurity and the IOMT space. And I am sure the audience have enjoyed it thoroughly because it was quite deep and the security principle of CIA Reminds me of a childhood game that I used to play, <laughs> acting as a CIA, but definitely, yes. I never yes. worked for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, thank you. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So moving on is, um, Brendan, uh, I would like to, I would like to ask you a question is focusing on the connected clusters. Would you like to give some uh, highlight on what do you mean by a connected cluster and how can innovators take advantage of a cluster and how collaborative working can help them get their idea into commercial space? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, so the connected health and well-being cluster, as I said, I'm, I'm based in Dundalk Institute of Technology in Ireland. And really it's about bringing together, uh, I suppose, traditional healthcare and uh, technology and look, you know, I, I've seen it, um, you know, in the past, there were sort of two distinct uh, businesses, uh, business sectors, but um, they have to come together. They have been coming together. And I think even now the new digital health companies are probably more in sort of IT company space than actually a health company space. So I think there's still work to bring them together. Um, so we've seen a, a large growth in cluster activity across Europe. There's about 3,000 clusters uh, in Europe. And the benefit um, for companies in particular is that you get to access um, expertise and technology that may not be in your immediate sphere. So for instance, you had Paul there talking with his uh, cybersecurity background, talking about maybe some of the stuff that he did in FinTech which could be just as equally relevant for a health company. And, you know, in the past, they may not have access to that information or they mightn't have collaborated, you know, with a startup or an established company around cybersecurity. Uh, in my own case, uh, you know, one of our members is involved in the food sector. And you go, well, why is a food sector, you know, in a digital health cluster? Um, but they're actually uh, collecting sea salt from the ocean 
and the byproduct of that is magnesium and um, you know which is actually turning out more valuable than the salt uh, you know and you know they spent a lot of money doing o d on magnesium uh, where they probably could have actually shared that research and development with a, a company outside of the food sector so the notion of cooperation where you have companies uh, or organizations coming together uh, to collaborate and some levels they'd be competing jay but in other, other levels they'll be able to support each other and it could be on market development it could be on research and development uh, it could be on joint strategies it could be as something as simple as joint training um, you know but if you if you get them talking to each other earlier um, innovation will happen quicker and be less expensive so that's the, the notion of it Oh, yes. And that's a very important one, because when you collaborate and work together, uh, synergies are formed and companies are able to work faster and get better results. So would I be wrong in stating that a connected cluster would be a one stop solution for an innovator for all their needs? Look, um, you know, it, 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 it's interesting. My background is around small business support and enterprise and innovation. And, you know, that can be a confusing space, you know, listening to EVID as a startup process. And I used to think that that was the most confusing process as, as a startup, you know, where do you get support? But when you add in healthcare, it just adds in another uh, level of confusion, you know, to a company that wants to scale up. Uh, so getting the advice early, you know, going back to Greer's point around risk assessment and, um, you know, if you were looking at some of the larger trends, uh, and it's a core part of what we've been talking around here, you know, what is cybersecurity and regulations? It's all going to be around interoperability. Um, and, you know, like, again, not to pick on Eva, you know, but looking at her example where you have to um, access different information, you know, and somebody using uh, her app might have four or five other uh, ailments, you know. So if I, you know, in the future, I don't want to have five or six different apps even, uh, you know, so how is Eva's app going to interact with, uh, you know, an, another healthcare uh, support system? Uh, because look, there's apps coming out all the time and there's other, you know, digital therapeutics and there's other uh, digital health solutions. Uh, but at the moment, they're not, uh, that's just because we're called connected health, but at the moment, they're not really connecting with each other and that interoperability uh, is is a huge issue uh, you know, globally and so. okay well wishing you luck whenever things get connected <laughs> with the cluster yes there would be more things coming in and well for thank you for giving a good amount of introduction and the importance of a cluster and how uh, companies together can form synergies yeah. and so build up. I would say one yeah. final thing on that, uh, Jay, yeah. just with, because it's clusters, we're, we're seeing a lot of clusters and, you know, this is a London-based, so for instance, uh, you know, I've had quite, quite a few meetings with the uh, North Tech, uh, the Health Tech cluster in the Northwest, uh, and it just makes it easier, in, instead of a company-to-company -company approach, you're getting groups of companies together, uh, introducing each other, matchmaking, seeing what supports, are out there and uh, accessing, you know, whether it's from the supplier or from the sales point of view. So it's just a, a simpler way to do it that you're, you're getting the benefit of meeting groups of companies at the same time. So it's a very simple concept. Right. And before before I move on towards the closing, would you like to give any three key takeaways for the audience on how they can ensure whatever they are developing or whatever they are working on is all successful? So would you give us a three key takeaways uh, from a cluster point of view? Yeah, well, look, I, I think, um, you know, Gria mentioned earlier on around defining um, your product or your service, um, you know, what regulatory issues you're coming under. And so I think that's probably the, the key thing that I've seen over the last six months. Uh, the earlier you do that, the better off you are. And, you know, there's an awful lot of confusion. Uh, and Gria was right around, for example, Irish companies targeting the US. But it's just a, it's a more expensive process when they have to come back um, and look at it at that side. Um, I, I think um, you know how you collaborate with people as well is 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 it's is going to be uh, really important uh, from that interoperability and going back into Paul's point and supply chain management. You know that you it goes down to you only as you know the weakest link out there. 
Um, and you're going to see that from the HSE. Uh, in particular, you're also going to see it around uh, sustainable healthcare in the future as well. Uh, so it won't just be security. They'll be checking, you know, what sort of uh, sustainability uh, from an environmental perspective uh, your coal suppliers have in there as well. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, you put me on the spot there, Jay, so I think I might leave it at that uh, in the interest of time as well. Okay, yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Brendan, for all the quick inputs. And I'm sure the audience has a good amount of takeaway from this session. Um, before we close on the session, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. And I would request Eileen from One Nucleus to kind of pop in and help me out. Uh, if the sessions, uh, if the attendees have any questions to be answered. I can't see any more than the ones you already answered. Uh, and I think as uh -huh. you said, you provided a really good amount <laughs> of information already. Um, I noted the link that you put in the chat box. Uh, yeah. And just to say that's good for attendees, but I will also put it on the YouTube box for anyone who's watching the video. So then they can get in touch with speakers directly. Yeah, that should be interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure if they have any questions, they can connect with them, connect with the panelists straight away. Or alternatively, they can drop an email to mdd at uh, mddltd.com and our team will help them connect with all the uh, panel members directly. Okay, well, that's it from our side and thanks for joining and giving us an opportunity to present MedTech and the Internet of Medical Things uh, for the one Genesis 2021. So, and I would like to cl co close this session from our site. Great. Thank you, Jay. Bye. And yeah. thank you, everyone. Thank that you, was everyone. a Bye. really, really good session. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah, a big thank you to all the panel members as well for taking out time and uh, enlightening our audiences. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.